Exploring Dark Matter and Dark Energy with Renee Lorraine, Euclid Project Scientist, ESA. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. Now this week we're going to talk about the incredible mysteries of dark matter and dark energy. Later in the show we're going to be joined by Renee LaRais, nuclear project scientist from the European Space Agency. How cool, huh? If one were to look at all the matter and energy in the universe, about 68% is dark energy, 27% is dark matter, and just about 5% is everything we see around us. Uh, cats, stars, planets, every 95% is totally unknown. That's chicken feed. What is most of the universe? Good question. Dark matter, in short, are regions of gravity moving stars and galaxies around with apparently nothing to cause it. It's a bit like an unseen poltergeist, throwing things around, leaving us scratching our heads, wondering what just caused that lamp to fly across the room. The tale of dark matter begins 90 years ago in 1933. Now, to bring it back, this was the year when Albert Einstein emigrated to the United States, work began on the Golden Gate Bridge, and Prohibition was repealed. Meanwhile, astronomer Fritz Zwicky was studying the great coma cluster of galaxies, finding their movement suggested this galactic group had ten times as much mass as everything which could be seen in the region. Now, astronomers called this mysterious unseen stuff dark matter, because this invisible something acts like matter, except it's dark. In the 1970s, astronomers Vera Rubin and Kent Ford were studying the rotational rates of spiral galaxies, expecting stars to move more slowly at their rims than near their centers. Instead, Stars near the outer rims of galaxies were seen spinning faster than expected, seemingly defying the laws of gravitation. Rubin and Ford suggested that there may be dark matter, which could also possibly tie in with Zwicky's dark matter. Now, let's unveil the prime suspects for what dark matter might be. One theory suggests it could be wimps, weakly interacting massive particles, interacting with regular matter through gravity, but otherwise remaining the universe's best hide-and-seek champions. Another kind of are axions, hypothetical, ultra-lightweight particles that could fill the universe like a cosmic fog. Or dark matter it might be machos, small objects giving off too little light to be seen by astronomers. Or maybe all our ideas of gravity are just wrong. Now today, researchers are in a galactic scavenger hunt to uncover more information about the nature of dark matter. On the 1st of July, the Euclid mission launched to space on a quest to uncover the mysteries of dark matter and its cosmological antagonist, dark energy. Next up, we're going to talk with Rene Lorace, a project scientist on this remarkable mission. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, Planets and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are delighted to be joined by Rene Lores. He is a, a, a Euclid project scientist currently working on this amazing mission with the European Space Agency. Welcome to the show, Rene. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah. So can you tell us first a little bit about the Euclid mission and what it is that you folks are hoping to accomplish? 
Yeah, Euclid is uh, is a space telescope basically, and with this space telescope, we want to measure the sky and uh, lots of skies, survey mission, in order to get the distribution of galaxies in our universe, as well as the distribution of dark matter in our universe. And with the distribution, I mean the position in uh, on the sky, as well as uh, the distance, and the distance I speak of time here, and that's what we in astronomical jargon call redshift. Mm -hmm. So we have a three-dimensional map in position and redshift of both galaxies as well as uh, dark matter. And from that, we derive the dark matter properties in our universe, but also the expansion of the universe. It tells us something about the expansion of the universe if we do that. And um, this expansion is very important. And now I come to the crux of the, the story because we want to measure the dark energy. And dark energy was only discovered 25, I think 25 years ago. And we have no clue what it is. We do have some clues. Scientists are good in, the, in finding clues, of course. We, we do have a model which fits very well, but it doesn't tell us much about the physics. The nature of the physics and um, we want to understand with Euclid in more detail what really this dark matter is and at the moment the dark matter is characterized by a acceleration accelerated expansion of the universe mm. um, and the measurements are quite crude in the sense that we measure an accelerated expansion but we have not a very good um, characterization of this uh, uh, acceleration and we want to do it with Euclid and that, that gives us more insights in what we call dark energy. It's just a, a, a term dark energy. It might not even uh, uh, yeah, be dark energy in that respect, but a new uh, physical phenomenon. That's, that's fabulous. I want to come back to that in a little bit, but this instrument, Euclid, is going to be gathering data and images from vast, vast uh, portions of the of the universe. If I'm remembering this off, had you're going to be recording something like sixty percent of the visible universe. If I'm remembering correctly. No, it's it's one third. <laughs> it's thirty six percent. Yeah, but that's huge. It's still it's a, a big fraction because a lot of we see on the sky is dominated by the Milky Way. If you look outside, you oh, see the Milky yeah. Way and all the stars. Uh, that's not what we want. We want to see the galaxies. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, for that, we have to look outside the Milky Way. And what Euclid is going to do is take the third of the sky, which is really uh, not uh, disturbed by many stars in our uh, Milky Way, and look out uh, to, to the universe. And what we are going to do is, uh, if you know that there are of the order uh, of 200 billion galaxies in our universe, that's a crude estimate, and we are going to measure about 2 billion of these galaxies carefully to do the weak lensing experiment. So we are really going to measure the sizes of these uh, galaxies. And on top of it, we measure about say 8 billion more galaxies, which we cannot resolve. So it's a significant fraction of our universe, of our visible universe we are mapping here. So it's, it's, it's quite a, a lot of information we're going to collect this way. Mm. And of course, this isn't the only um, program looking to gather large sky surveys. The Vera Rubin telescope is going to be right hopefully coming online soon. What what do we learn about the universe from these, yeah. from these well, huge sky surveys? After, after the dark energy was discovered, people were scratching their heads. How can we make these measurements more accurate? Yeah? How can we get, uh, uh, because it was difficult. Initially, dark energy was observed to look at through supernovae uh, events. Mm -hmm. And you only get one supernova once in a while. So mm -hmm. now, now uh, by now we have hundreds of supernovae measured, but it's not enough. So people thought that looking at the structures in 
or universe and how these structures evolve in time was the best measure to, to understand the expansion of the universe. So that's where the big surveys came in. One, one of the uh, projects people thought of was a all sky survey from, from ground with, uh, with a very uh, powerful telescope and that is Rubik. Um, we have opted for Euclid as a all sky survey or a extra galactic survey to measure the galaxies with a high resolution in order to, uh, to do the weak lensing experiment as we say so. Um, and with, with Euclid, we um, um, can look in the infrared. We have an infrared uh, um, instrument on board. And like JWST, which is everything in the infrared, we use infrared to look at high redshift. So because the distant galaxies we want to measure are red. Okay. And if you even go further in the distance, you go to the infrared, which you cannot do from ground, because the light is uh, is blocked by the uh, by the atmosphere. So Euclid is outside our atmosphere and can measure all these galaxies in the infrared, which are more distant than what uh, Rubin can detect. Hmm. So we are complementary to to the observations of the ground based uh, data. And that is good because in the end, we end up with a, a huge database of our universe, which we can even, if we have more, if these, all these data become available, astronomers will have the opportunity to put everything together, which is a huge effort, of course, but that would only increase our knowledge of, uh, of this phenomenon, which we call dark energy. Hmm. And if we could get a really good handle on the rate of expansion of the dark energy expansion, what could that help teach us about the past and future of the universe, as well as the laws of nature? Well, we know, we, we get to know a lot of the past of our universe with Euclid. And with the past, I mean the last 10 billion years of our evolution of, uh, of the universe. So uh, from looking at what has happened in the last 10 billion years, we can understand uh, what is causing the, uh, the uh, accelerated expansion and how it causes the, uh, the, uh, the structure in our uh, universe. From that, we can derive what will be our future, um, but that can only be done with simulations. That is to say, um, um, from the past, we derive a physical model, and from that, if the physics is correct, we can at least extrapolate to the future, but uh, we cannot observe the future, as you understand. <laughs> that would be great if uh, astronomers could do this. Right, right. <laughs> <be even. laughs> and so probably two of the biggest questions in cosmology are what is the nature of dark matter and what is the nature of dark energy? There are a lot of ideas out there, but what are, what are your favorites right now? Well, I'm, I'm a very conservative guy in that respect. Uh, um, we have this fiducial model or the, uh, or the concordance model, we call it, which is the uh, uh, lumpole dark matter model. And the lambda stands for the cosmological constant. And this is basically where I th should rely on at the moment, because that's the most compelling model. In the last few years, we find what, what, what cosmologists call tensions, that is observations which do not fit into this model um, to the level of accuracy we would have expected. And I'm, 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 I'm saying this very carefully because it's, it's a matter of error bars. If your error bar is just outside what you would expect, then you call it a tension. It's not a, a glaring, uh, <laughs> uh, what is to say, uh, uh, mismatch, but usually it's, a, a, well, something is obviously wrong, but how much you, uh, you still have to quantify it in good detail. Mm -hmm. And um, that is what Euclid is going to do. I mean, um, 
we have an understanding of our universe according to this model and the Planck data would fit very well this model, but also uh, data we, we observe on ground. They do not match completely, but we hope with Euclid get much more detailed uh, questions on the uh, on this model, yeah, answers on uh, on how this model uh, would predict. And if we find discrepancies, we would be very happy because that can tell us more about uh, uh, the true nature of the phenomena we uh, observe. So <laughs> I don't have a favorite model. I I I. Just say well, we do have the uh, the lambda colder matter model and see where the uh, where the problems arise. And I know for sure if you do theory, if 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 you're a theoretician, you can always find a solution to <laughs> to to this. And uh, yeah, <laughs> and you know we talk about theories sort of going where you wouldn't expect them to go, but there's been recent stories, both in the popular, a lot in the popular press, but uh, out of the University of Iowa, uh, Ottawa rather, uh, talking about the idea that the universe could be 26.7 billion years old, about twice what we expected or what most people are measuring or figuring. What, what are your first thoughts on that? Uh, I, th I think it's extremely interesting uh, that uh, they come with such a theory. So I, uh, I, uh, yeah, it it caught my attention as well. It was in the news a lot. Yeah. Um, each time when you look at the sky with a different instrument, and uh, Hubble, the Hubble telescope is not called Hubble, just. Because because we wanted to measure the Hubble constant, yeah, very accurately, and the Hubble telescope has shown us very new things, very new phenomena, and then we launched JWST, the James Webb Telescope, and what the James Webb did was we can look in the infrared very deep to very very early to the very early universe, and that is exactly what JWST did. It found sources which are really close to where the Big Bang started. So a few million years, or a few tens of, well, hundreds of million years after. And they found sources, and these sources were galaxies. And these galaxies appear older than they expected. Now, as I said before, <laughs> Um, you do observations which you cannot interpret, or which does not fit in your current model, and you have to find alternatives for that are at least compelling theories to uh, to uh, to explain it and one of the explanations is that our universe in fact started earlier and then uh, that makes it older from our perspective 26 billion years old rather than the 13.8 or 13.4 billion which is always thought so far so it, it is a theory, and it is a way to explain what we see with JWST. And I know for sure if we uh, if we start our survey with Euclid, that we also see these type of things, and uh, that uh, that might also that could, in fact, uh, uh, confirm the theory uh, of the twenty six billion years. But it could also say that it's it's not correct. So I I I, I let the observation speak here. But I'm not, uh, yeah, uh, I'm not saying that is the solution for everything. All right. It's exciting now. Um, yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. To say. So Euclid, it, we talked about it's going to be producing huge amounts of data. Um, something like Euclid will produce more data in a week than Hubble has in 30 years. And it's supposed, and when I'm reading, it's already returning about twice as much data as web. Uh, how are you going to process that huge amount of data? And then might you use artificial intelligence to do it? Yeah, it's difficult. Um, when we when we started uh, designing Euclid, we just assumed that everything will grow in time. So we uh, we we assumed Moore's law, for instance, in terms of. <laughs> Uh, uh, processing capacity, uh, 
how much uh, uh, memory we can use and all these things. So uh, we hope that by the time UKIT will fly that uh, the systems we decided at that time, so, so, so some 15 years ago, would be more normal than, than that we thought of at that time. Now, um, we have a system now which can cope with the processing, but the distribution is a different thing because it's all um, um, limited by the internet lines. Hmm. So we, we can uh, collect huge amount of data. So we have a special band from the, 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 the satellite it will be sent to the to us to ESA. We distribute it to the data centers in a, in a, in a distributed way. So all the data we get in will be distributed over nine data centers, which will do the processing uh, side by side, and we will it will be returned to us all the data. The next question is how do we distribute the data among the astronomers and we still have to uh, to find a good way how to do it and what we are thinking now is to uh, to let the astronomers compute remotely at our site which we call data labs and then only if they have their final results they can download it themselves because that's a amount of data they can comprehend but if everyone would for instance download images which we get from uh, from the satellite, um, then we would be uh, stuck <laughs> quite quickly. Uh, mm -hmm. So we get this huge amount of data. For that, we have uh, uh, developed. We are more than a decade busy developing processing pipelines. Uh, we have, as I said, nine data centers which will work in parallel. So this is the way we are going to process the data. And with processing, I mean. We will have clean images as well as huge catalogs, like the catalogs that Gaia did, of all the targets we find in the images. So that is already a reduction. The catalogs is uh, it's less information, but the catalogs will be so big that even the catalogs are not uh, easy to port. Mm. So we have to find ways of uh, how to get information out of these catalogs. And there, uh, artificial intelligence comes along. For instance, if you want to look at uh, um, um, gravitational lenses, strong gravitational lenses, for instance, Euclid will be a massive uh, 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 detector of strong gravitational lenses. But you need pattern recognition in order to see these lenses because well, you cannot look by eye anymore. You, you need a machine to uh, discover these lenses. So for that, we have uh, artificial intelligent algorithms uh, developed. And that is one example. Um, we understand that galaxies evolve in time. We, we, we look 10 billion years and their morphology or their shapes change in time. Yeah. And in order to recognize these uh, different morphologies, we also use artificial intelligence programs nowadays. There are different flavors of these programs and uh, scientists um, optimize them. So, it is an art in itself, and I think that astronomy is one of the forerunners of, of using this type of uh, software or tools, as we call it nowadays. Mm -hmm. And finally, as this airs, Euclid has just reached L2, the L2 orbit spot, to hang out with the James Webb Space Telescope. So what are the next steps? in uh, uncovering the mysteries of the cosmos and dark matter and dark energy. Yeah, well, I mean, on, on its way to L2, uh, um, we did all the uh, checkouts of the uh, of the spacecraft instruments. So uh, we have some uh, good idea what we can see with Euclid. Um, the next few months, we will do the scientific checkout of the uh, of the uh, instru instrument. So what we are going to do is uh, uh, look at astronomical sources, look at uh, uh, stars in order to give, have a very good calibration of the instrument. Mm -hmm. um, Euclid is an experiment. 
I call it an experiment. It's not just a telescope or an observatory. It's really an experiment where we measure billions of galaxies very accurately uh, in terms of shape in order to determine the dark matter distribution in the universe. And this is a, a huge amount of data processing and also relying on the, uh, the uh, uh, specification or the characterizations of the telescope. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is a process which is using the sky, the observations we do, and um, uh, the, uh, the expectations how the telescope works, because we are going really to the edge of what the telescope can do for us. And that's a lot of work and that has to be done. Uh, that's the reason why it takes, well, for the first data release, we are planning uh, about, it, it will be 26 months from now, well, a bit more than 26 months, in order to get all this processing in place, uh, check the data, and also check uh, how the science comes up. Hmm. And for that, we have a, a huge consortium of astronomers. It's uh, of the order of uh, 2,500 astronomers, which will do this. And once we have uh, the data well understood, we will release it to the public. Um, now, if you say, I have to wait 26 months in order to, uh, to see the first Euclid image, it's not true. We, we will have... Uh, uh, earlier releases of data, so you can already uh, play with the data, and uh, it's enormous. I mean, we have our first images down now, the first uh, engineering images, and it's really uh, the, mm -hmm. the the strength is the panoramic view of, uh, of of this telescope. So if if you have one image of the sky, it's huge. It's uh, it's uh, two and a half full moons of information mm -hmm. with with a resolution which is well better than uh, than what you can see with your uh, with your best telescope to the moon in fact mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, your backyard telescope so to say and uh, it's enormous you can uh, you, you you can sit for hours behind the, the computer and look at all the uh, stars and galaxies and other objects uh, which which already are in these first images so it's it's amazing yeah, it's about that. So all this information is coming down at a rate uh, which is uh, yeah it's hard to catch up and uh, I think that uh, we we have uh, that first of all we need artificial intelligence to understand the, all these images and secondly we need a lot of astronomers and a lot of time to uh, to uh, to explore this database. Wow. Well, the, this mission is just so exciting and it's really incredible all the work you're, you and your team have done and really appreciate you taking the time to do the show. Great talk. Yes, I, and so um, I'd just like to say thank you for being on the show. It was, it was, it was fabulous yeah. talking with you. Yeah, you were. Welcome. It's uh, I, I really uh, uh, would like to also like to thank all the people working on it. I mean, uh, um, there is a uh, huge team, yeah. both scientists, engineers, um, and they are all fascinated by this uh, by by the topic measuring mm -hmm. dark energy. So there is a lot of motivation to do it well so uh, that, that's very good and, and as the project side is it's it's not very difficult to convince them that it's uh, it's it's a very great work they are doing <laughs> and have done so far so I, I i also appreciate their work absolutely absolutely and um that was renee lorace a euclid project scientist from the european space agency Thank you. Dark energy's effects are like the cosmic equivalent of a gentle nudge, pushing galaxies apart like an invisible chaperone at a cosmic teenage dance party. 
observation show that for the last several billion years at least, galaxies have been racing apart from each other at an increasing rate. Now imagine being on a roller coaster. After coming down the first big hill, your cart would be going at its maximum speed. That's the Big Bang. If your cart then heads slightly uphill, you might likely expect the cart to slow down. But suppose it started speeding up instead. You need roller coasters with extra energy that can't be explained. Try the Hades Hurler. New from Impish Inversions. That would require the application of energy. Now, the energy to drive the increasingly quick expansion of the universe is the result of... Well, no one really knows yet. Hence, dark energy. In the late 1990s, two independent teams of astronomers were studying the expansion rate of the universe using observation of distant supernovae, or exploding stars. Their observations indicated that something was counteracting gravity's influence, causing galaxies to move away from each other at a continually increasing pace. But what could dark energy be? The theories are as diverse as the flavors at an intergalactic ice cream parlor. Now, some think it's a property of space itself akin to an anti-gravitational stretchiness that makes the universe expand faster. Others suggest it might be linked to a new type of particle sneaking around undetected like a cosmic ninja. As we venture deeper into this cosmic ballet, one thing's certain. The universe has more surprises in store, and dark matter and dark energy are the backstage maestros orchestrating it all. Next week on The Cosmic Companion, we're going to take on a weighty subject. Gravity! What is it? How does it work? And why does it keep getting you down? Well, welcome Joe Swiggum from the Nanograv Collaboration to the show, talking about the weakest, yet most familiar force in the universe. Make sure to join us starting on the 19th of August. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode of The Cosmic Companion, please subscribe, follow, and share our show on whichever format you're using right now. So I'm pretty sure we're on there. Clear skies.